Prog, metal, prog, and everything in between. If you're into rock, you've come to the right place. Welcome to this episode of Talkin' Rock with Meltdown. Don't forget to follow the audio-only Talkin' Rock podcast on all podcast platforms. And now, it's time for today's conversation. Here's Meltdown. Well, Chris, good to make your acquaintance. Of course, your music has been a... uh has been uh, uh, woven in throughout my entire career. We'll talk about that coming up. But first, you're coming to University of Michigan and exactly what you're going to be an assistant professor. Is that correct? Okay, tell me what your exact title. My exact title is Assistant Professor of Performing Arts Technologies, which um, performing arts technology in my world will be MIDI production, um, analog and digital audio recording and mixing and and editing and sound design with sound effects and microphones and uh, you know what we're doing right now. It's it's all of that. Michigan has three amazing studios, two of which have like it, their studio facilities there are are beyond world class. Uh, when I went up there to interview, I was just t- blown away by the whole department and everything they had. So super excited to get up there and start playing. Now, if correct me if I'm wrong, did you start like teaching when you, you had shoulder surgery or something a few years back? Yeah, I, I've been teaching now 11 years. Um, I started in the fall of 2013. The short version goes, I've been drumming since I was six years old. And um, in, in early 2013, I started noticing some really bad shoulder problems. Like I got to the point where I couldn't even like roll over in bed on my left side without that pain jolt waking me up. Finally went and had an MRI and turned out I had torn out my rotator cuff. Um, I didn't do it drumming. I actually did it in the gym working out with my trainer. Um, but it's 40 years of repetitive motion. Mm-hmm. Uh, the sockets are nothing but bone spurs. It's just, you know, sawing slowly through. So I had a couple tours booked starting that fall. I had already left Manson and I was going to go drum for a band that I, um, produced and worked with for quite a while out of Italy. So I was going to drum for them because they were coming to the States. And then, um, Joey Jordanson, um, from Slipknot, he was working on his latest solo record. He had left Slipknot at that point. Mm. He had a solo project called Scar the Martyr, which, uh, I helped do a lot of the production and keyboards and electronics. So I was going to, I was actually going to be his keyboard player in his band. And all of that came to a grinding halt because my doc, my, you know, surgeons are like, you know, you, you you can't jump up on down on. I mean, they were right. It was you know when you hear about athletes with a knee or a shoulder and they're out for an entire season. I know why now because it's trying to the the PT was just unbearable. But I was also uh, what's the word uh, volunteering my time at some after school arts programs, and I had started flying out doing like little get like they call them master classes. Yeah. You know, well, they'll bring someone in for a day. And I started doing a couple of those, and I really liked it. Teaching is a a different form of entertaining. You're trying to keep your audience entertained, students. You prepare your set list, lesson plan. You can tell if they're bored or not, like in a crowd, you know, they're like, "Uh uh-oh, we're losing them. (laughs) Um, You know, you get up on a stage, front of the class, podium, whatever you have, and you try to deliver stuff you know uh info entertainment whatever it is so i kind of just I, I really liked it and um so one of the schools that i had done a master class for i did it i did a master class for him twice heard about my shoulder and they were like dude what are you gonna do and i was like i don't know because i just had my, i had to cancel my whole year worth of touring at that point and they actually had an opening and asked if i'd want to come to wisconsin and give it a give it a go for a year because I needed someone anyway. And maybe I could do teaching while I'm rehabbing and talked it over with my partner, Melissa. And we were like, yeah, I was in LA for 20 years time. Let's, let's go somewhere new. Mm -hmm. And that was that I've been teaching ever since. You know, Uh, when I, when I was watching this little mini interview that you did a few years ago, it got me to, it reminded me of when I was coaching my daughter's hockey team, my expectations were about here. And what I got was way up here. Is, is, <laughs> is, is that, does that even come close to your experience? I, I, I do understand that. Uh, yeah. You, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't know like the teaching part 
like getting in front of people and doing a lecture or, you know, whatever we're doing, a lesson that came to me like, I mean, I've been performing since I was, you know, a little kid in various states. I had my first punk band playing bars when I was 13. My dad used to have to drive me to the bar, and, you know, <laughs> sit in the bar while my little band performed because I was so young. Bartenders were like, you're not, no, you, you know. And as soon as I was done, I'd be like, can I, can I stick around and watch the headliner? that we Because we opened for all the bigger punk bands in the area. And bartender's like, you're lucky I even let you in the play. Get out or you're going to cost me my license, you know. So we'd have to load up the old Buick and head back home. But um, I, the teaching was the easy part. The, the hardest part was shifting focus for myself, like all the ancillary work, you know, lesson planning, grade books, committee meetings, HR, payroll. Like I'd never had insurance. I mean, there is no health plan in Marilyn Manson. It's simply just <laughs> don't die. You know, I mean, you know, something happens to you, we'll rush you to the hospital. Maybe, you know, <laughs> so it, it was, it was a real lifestyle change, but I needed it anyway, mentally and emotionally, but seeing that when I was growing up and, and we were doing it and then all the early nine inch nail stuff, you know, it was Trenton, Trenton me, you know, up until, you know, after like pretty hate machine stuff. I mean, we had people come in and out, um, and stuff, but you know, most of the time, you know, he'd get an idea and he'd be like, Hey man, I, I got to try this. Will you, you know, put up the, put up the tapes and, you know, but we're still talking analog 24 track tape. Yeah. You know, so he's like, we put up the tape and because if he's going to go in the other room and sing, somebody has to engineer. And I don't, there's no college degree in how to record a rock album. You know, there, there, now there is. Right. And I teach it. <laughs> it's weird. So when I see, when I see young people that really want to take it seriously and, and go to school, it, it, I, I just think supporting them and, and do, helping them is like the coolest thing you can do. You know, because yeah. I wish I would have had that when I was that age. Right. Right. It didn't, yeah. it didn't exist. So yeah. you just had a, what's this button do? <laughs> and so I was like, oh, sh okay, let's not say anything to the studio manager. I don't know. That button just doesn't work. I don't know. <laughs> you know, that whole thing. Yeah. My, my brother was seven years younger than me. And I remember the same, I had the same experience with you at a bar. The bar, the owner wanted to kick him out. And then he, then he found out I was there and he's like, oh, he can stay as long as he wants. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> I guess, but anyway, so, so you grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, and I grew up uh, just north of you outside of Buffalo. But uh, so no what, what what city? I grew up by Darien Lake. Did you ever play Darien Lake? Oh, I know Darien Lake. I never played it, but I know exactly. I've been there. I know exactly. Yeah. What Erie is what? We're like, we're like 90 minutes to Buffalo, 90 minutes to Cleveland, 90 yeah. minutes to Pittsburgh. You know, we're right yeah. in that Bermuda Triangle. So we used to go to Niagara Falls every year and, you know, go up that way in Darien Lake and. Oh, that's I I'm very familiar. Are you a Bills fan? Um, I, well, I've been here for 28, almost 29 years. So I've kind of lost a little bit of that. But I was at all those playoff games and all that stuff, you know, back in the early 90s. But uh, yeah. four in a row, baby. Yeah, four in a row. <laughs> we don't want to get into that too much. But uh, yeah, well, that's a that's a whole other conversation. Hey, by the way, speaking of Manson and, you know, I, knew, I know you worked with Rob Zombie. Did your paths ever cross with Detroit's own John Five? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, when I first left Nine Inch Nails in the late 90s and, and moved back because we were in New Orleans at that point. And when I left the band, um, I moved back to L.A. Um, and, you know, it's probably one of the first people that um, a manager I was working with wanted to introduce. He introduced me to like two people like right up, you know, right off the bat. Like, hey, I got these friends. I, you know, one of them was John. Um, but back then he was still John Lowry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, so he and I jammed on a couple things. And the other one was Wayne Kramer from the MC5. Oh, yeah. And Wayne did some guitar riffs on my first solo album, the Tweaker album in 2000. And Wayne was a great, like, dad figure kind of source, you know. And we just lost him, you know, a few months ago now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and We lost the drummer. So speaking of Detroit, I mean, all four members now of the MC5 are gone. Right. I just saw that. Yeah. Um, so where do you, whereabouts do you, do you meet Trent? We met in Pennsylvania. So I'm from Erie, Pittsburgh's, let's say Pittsburgh's two hours South. You go an hour, split the difference between Erie and Pittsburgh. There's the little town called Mercer, Pennsylvania, where Trent is from. And, um, I was playing in a band 
in my uh, in and around Erie area, Meadville, and so all those areas. And my keyboard player John, he, uh, Trent was selling a drum machine, and I was deep into electronic music and you know it's new wave you know our bass player had a guitar for bass and i had a big simmons electronic drum set doo, 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 and all that stuff and my keyboard player was friends with trent because they both owned an incredibly rare and expensive synthesizer at that time uh, german synth so they were already friends and he's like i got this buddy the trent's selling uh this drum machine called a lindrum and i was like oh man i would love to have one of those for my collection and he's like, well, let me tell him that, you know, we'll we'll come down. So we drove down there on a weekend and I met him and I bought his drum machine off of him. And we immediately kind of clicked. You know, when you meet somebody, you just kind of click. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of stayed friends, stayed in touch. Cut to a year or so later, he's he had moved to Cleveland and was playing in a very successful regional synth pop band at the time. I was going to Kent State University, which is... 30 minutes south of Cleveland. And um, I would always drive up though to see his band play because like I said, we'd been friends and, you know, he called me down in the dorm and say, I mean, we're playing, you know, blah, 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 and stuff like that. One day he called my dorm and the drummer in the synth pop band, who's classically trained drummer had just found out he had re gotten the job as the principal percussionist for the Cleveland Philharmonic Orchestra. So he was like, see ya, <laughs> you know, and he's like, dude, uh, we need a drummer. And uh, he's like, any way you'd want to, you know, come up and like, you know, audition and stuff. And it was a three piece band. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I'd been to every show. I already knew the other guys in band and stuff. So drove up there with my electronic drum set in, in my Honda Civic. And uh, we played through the songs and, you know, we just looked at each other and like, all right you're in the band let's go get Chinese food and a band called Skinny Puppy was playing that night and I was like I'd never heard this was 86 so I'm like I never heard of Skinny Puppy I mean they one of my all-time favorite bands and molded the industrial genre I mean they're legends yeah. and uh, so they're like oh, we'll get Chinese food and go see we'll go catch Puppy down at the this famous venue that's no longer there and that was it and then we were in a band together for you know that band lasted another year and a half or so and finally kind of it had run its course and Trent started writing songs and those songs became pretty hate machine. Yeah. Awesome. No, yeah. I was listening today to a uh, downward spiral, which just turned uh, 30 and it's I like, know. you know, some of the, some of the techniques and some of the, I'm not, I, I, for lack of a better word, some of the gimmicks that you guys used in that record with like the screaming, but it's like super low in the mix yeah. and just different things like that has always attracted me. Was, was that, was that a lot of you or was that like a lot of Trent or a little yes. bit of both? A little bit of both. My my big job on that record was sound designing. So, like, you know, the song Reptile starts with that clanky loop and it, it forms the rhythm that then the drums come on top of. That is a combination of the 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 door in, in the in the in the movie Aliens, the second one at the beginning, when they find Ripley, um, they 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 cut through this uh big door and the door goes. Zzz, zzz, zzz. And then there's these creaks and clanks that were kind of rhythmic that came from another underwater horror movie called Deep Star Six, I think it was, or Deep Something. The D I don't remember now. And, you know, sample them and loop them. So a lot of that album is made up of not traditional instruments or sounds. You know, the percussion in, I think the I think it's the becoming. Um, um, that is just us dropping all like forks and knives on the floor while we were recording it with headphones on so we could play it in tempo you know industrial music gets its um gets its start way back like you can like music concrete you know where it's like found object stuff or early early 20th century you could then throw in like john cage who invented this thing called prepared piano and to this day you can buy sample libraries of various people's versions of pre prepared piano and what is that he would have a grand piano and he would drill random nails, throw handfuls of bolts, uh, nail into the wood so that when the string, when you hit the key, the strings would get stuck mm -hmm. between the nails or would, or like you'd hit the notes and all the loose bolts on the soundboard of a piano would just jiggle up and down from the vibrations. And there's, he's got this piece called water walk where he, like he's got all these 
household appliances running and he's using a timer and they turn on and off at different portions to kind of create an arrangement. So you get into that sort of thing. And then that led to a bunch of people in the seventies, like throbbing gristle beating on trash cans instead mm. of drums and combining it with more atonal stuff. And now those are kind of like the, the, so the idea of using weird samples and movie quotes and like a collage sort of thing, you know, that's kind of where it all comes from. Particularly what you're hearing in downward spiral is before we had Dolby Atmos and surround sound, Sony had this weird box. We were working at one of the big studios in LA at this point, finishing up spiral. And it was, it was like a three dimensional panning system where you could, it had these big jog wheels and you could pan it around like a traditional pan, but it was like kind of out of phase. So it would feel like it's way out here. You could also pan it like a Ferris wheel. So it would feel like it's above you and then coming through you. Oh, wow. So we would do all these weird tricks. And like, like you said, like Trent would do like a scream or a whisper, but it would be panned way as hard to the left side as possible. And then we turn it all the way down where like you put headphones on and you're like, turn it up. Okay, stop. And you can't really hear it in the mix, but if you had headphones on, halfway through the second verse, you know, you know, and it'd be like, yeah, you know, that was kind of the idea of the whole thing was to create this whole thing using effects and, and found sounds and things like that. Yeah, it, was a, it, was, it was a process. I was going to say, I, th I think we could talk about Donald Spire for like, hours. <laughs> but, uh, but then and that record comes out in, in 1994. And then a few months later, I was at that Woodstock show and that Woodstock show was that was, was that the most, um, I don't know, the, the craziest chaotic show you've ever played, you think? Uh, probably not the most chaotic, but it's, it will forever be, you know, burnt into my, I can't believe you were there. First of all, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a cool story. Um, it was one of the, it was crazy and wild because up to that point, we hadn't played anything that like we hadn't become an arena band yet. We were still doing small theaters, you know, a couple thousand seats, you know, big clubs, whatever. And then we did that set that night. I think we came on right after Crosby, Stills and Nash. And I think we were right before Metallica. Mm, yeah, so yeah. I think, I think the last four bands of that first night was Crosby, Stills and Nash, Nine Inch Nails, Metallica, Aerosmith, I think was the closer on that first night. Um, we rolled in the night before to avoid traffic and just slept. They, I mean, they had a massive area for everybody's tour buses, you know, so we just slept on the bus. But we walked around halfway through the night, and, and I remember the Orb. Uh, the Orb is one of my favorite, like, electronic ambient bands uh, mm -hmm. ever out of England. And they were doing, like, an all-night DJ set thing. And I was like, well, I got to go see the Orb, you know. So we went out and walking through the crowds, and people were just half asleep. Or, I mean, 300,000 people in a field. Like, I'll never – nothing has ever come even remotely close. I, I played a couple – you know, like Donington Rock Festival and Rock'em Ring, Rock'em Park. I, I played a few of those with Manson much later that Donington approaches 100, you know. Um, I've done Coachella, which I think now it's, well, when I was doing it, it was about 70,000, mm. you know. But not everybody's there just to see, like, you know what I mean? There's multiple stages. So if there's 70,000 people, you know, 10 of them are in the back tent watching somebody else. And But that Woodstock, man, it's, it's one huge, I mean, it was right there. So, um, you know, what made me actually ner more nervous about that was it was being broadcast live as a pay-per-view, like a multi-camera pay-per-view live event. So my parents, of course, bought it and my friends and my sister, and, you know, and there's these cameramen and remember it's 94. So we're not using GoPros. I mean, we're talking full size TV studio kind of cameras with the giant red light on the top. So, <laughs> and there was a, there was a bunch of them and one guy's position was right next to my riser the whole time. You know, he must've been drummer cam or whatever. <laughs> and I'd be playing and out of the corner of my eye, I'd see that red light come on. I'm like, I'm on air right now. And there was like, the numbers were somewhere between six and 8 million people paid to watch it live. So the, that became my more that became more stressful because I'm like oh my god my mom if I drop a stick oh my dad's and now I'm never you know never gonna hear the end of it yada yada and um, but to this day it's like nothing's ever really but come that close but that's also what catapulted the, the band you know yeah. and then that time closer we'd already had March of the Pigs video which was doing great 
Um, but closer hadn't really broken. And then, you know, do the closer video and the combination of Woodstock and the closer single. Um, and that was that, man. Next thing you know, we're playing two nights in a row at Madison Square Garden sellouts and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, uh, it's weird, though, that Closer became such a huge song if you listen to it. <laughs> well, uh, there's a story on that. So uh, our producer for that record, his name's Flood. And Flood is, to this day, still my favorite producer of all time. Um, Flood did my favorite PJ Harvey records. He did Violator for Depeche Mode. He did the big one for, um, I think he did Melancholy for Pumpkins. It, it, he did a band. He's He did a couple bands like, as we were coming up, bands from the 80s, like Pop Elite itself and It's a Rep, like electronic bands. So any any album that you look at and go, that's the best. Oh, he did uh, Zoo TV or Actung Baby for yeah, YouTube. YouTube. Really? Yeah. yeah. So any record where you go, that's the best record that band ever did, you flip it over and it's Flood. And you're like, so we had Flood and, and he was staying with us at the Tate House for, you know, for a couple month or two uh working on production on on downward spiral with us and we you know the music was already there pretty much and, and trent comes in he's like i got the lyrics man and so he's like i and so we go in you know we have our coffee and he's like okay and then he hits play and he sings he sings you know he sings closer and right. we we started like me and flood start laughing and i was like you know this is probably the most pop song that we have and if you think about it musically it is the most like pop sounding and structured song on the record and i said but you totally now ruined it and we'll never have a hit single because you say you know i don't know if we can swear on this podcast yeah, yeah you're fine i want to f you like an animal and trent's like i know i did it on purpose to make sure it can't be the pop single and i was like <laughs> me and Flutter, like I mean, what do you go like? How do you argue that? Like, okay, so he did it completely on purpose to to mess with it, and um, because he also thought it was too pop, and that was his way. But he loved the song, and and uh, didn't seem this like we just bleeped that word out, and it didn't seem to affect radio airplay at all. <laughs> I would just, I would just like to see some of the paychecks you guys get from just the strippers that's that dance that. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times we'd be on tour and you know, it'd be like uh, one of those gentlemen's clubs and you know, and they are what they are, but they find out that we're walking in and the DJ me is like <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, "No, I mean, thanks, but you know, we don't we're trying not to draw attention to ourselves here." Yeah, great. You know, um, uh, I asked uh, I asked Chris Cornell about this. I think it was on the 20th anniversary because you guys both dropped uh, yeah. Down Spiral, and uh, I, I think it was Super Unknown on the same. Super same Unknown both came out in 94. We played one show together. It was in um, – we combined our two tours. It was at Molson Park in Canada. We kind of did like a mini one-day festival, if you will. So it was, you know, our tour was us, Manson, and the Jim Rose Circus Sideshow. Mm. Forgot who their opening bands were, but we did a thing where it was like, you know, Manson, and then their opening band, then Jim Rose, you know what I mean? Like, when we kind of did it, and um, we played second to last and Soundgarden closed. Um, cool dudes. Um, I mostly talked to Matt, the drummer, you know, right. drummer, kind well, of go out. When I was I was talking to Chris about this, I said, "Do you guys know what you have in common with uh with Nine Inch Nails? Because this was during the summer of 2014 when they when they yeah. went back out on tour." And he says, "Well, we got guys who are from Chicago and blah blah blah." I said, "No, you." you well, I said, "Yeah, that's that's true, but you both have a song that was covered by Johnny Cash. So, what are your thoughts about the oh, yeah. about Hurt?" Oh yeah, that's right. He did what? Rusty Cage? Yes. Yeah. Um. Um. I was shocked when I first heard it because I'd been out of the band for quite some time when I first yeah. heard the Johnny Cash thing. And um, I just, I, like, it was weird. It was kind of, for me, because it brought back a lot of memories. I remember when we did Hurt. Hurt was a, the last song added to the album. It was like Trent thought it needed one more thing, and he'd been playing with this piano idea. And, we went back into the, we were already out of the Tate house. You know, we were living out of suitcases, getting ready for tour. And we went into the studio that night and I remember singing it and me and the, me and Sean, who did a lot of our engineering, we both, uh, you know, we we're both in tears and everything. And we we're like, yeah, that's, that's, 
that that's a song, you know? And um, so it brought back all those memories, which were kind of melancholy and, you know, sad, but also, you know, um, and I just thought it was a beautiful version of it. I, I know he was doing a lot of those covers at that time. He did like personal Jesus, yeah. and Russell Cage and, and Hurt. And um, I've always been, I'm not a country music fan at all. Don't even get me started. Everything since Garth Brooks has been garbage. Yeah. Um, but Johnny is, that's country music, you know, him and Conway Tritt, Twitty and, you know, Loretta Lynn and Hank, Hank with the original Hank, not Hank Jr., but first Hank and, you know, that kind of stuff. And so when I heard it, I was like, wow, man, what a crazy idea to do that. Um, and then I remember Chris saying, it, he, I go, I go, that might be the greatest video. He goes, he goes might be. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. And, and Johnny's was the same, like Hart was the same way. And knowing I don't think anybody knew he was that close to death when all that was being done, you know? Um, and so when he did finally pass, which was pretty quickly thereafter, you yeah. know, within, within a year or something, if I'm remembering it right, um, it made it all the more poignant that that was one of the last things he, you know, uh, performed and sang, you know, and recorded before he died. So it made it kind of extra special. Um I wasn't sure how Trent, we weren't talking at that time. So I like, wasn't sure how he felt about it at that time, but he's clear. He's on record all over the place now saying it's just like, you know, what an honor, you know, the funny thing is now 30 years later, I teach college soon to be at the university of Michigan. That's right. <laughs> and um, I cannot wait, go blue. And um, so my students will be like 18 to 22. So you back up 22 and these kids were born in 2002, you know, up to like 2005, perhaps. Yeah. I have had many a student not, they know Hurt. They have no idea that's a cover of a Nine Inch Nails song. They just oh. think it's a Cash song because they've never, 1994 is so far before. That's like when their parents were in college. You right. Know? And I'm 57. So, and Trent just had his birthday. Yeah. Uh, it's Friday. You know, well, we chatted briefly. Yeah. Um, I almost messaged you to remind you in case you had forgotten. Yeah, yeah, I never forget, believe me. <laughs> uh, we're like old family, Christmas, New Year's, Easter, birthdays, you know, we have a family chat. But, um, you know, it's it's like that so far before their time that a lot of them don't even really know those that album and, and, and that, you know, and I always find that crazy when people don't, when they think it's actually Johnny. Johnny made it his own so much that it really changed how the perception of that song, especially for the younger generation. But Hey, if they get into bands like nine inch nails because of it, all the better. Cause there's just too much garbage out there on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. There's, there's some stuff that's not great. Hey, so um, uh, real fast, we've got a couple minutes left here. Um, I mean, you guys obviously getting the rock and roll hall of fame in 2020. I saw as You said that, you know, what an honor that was and, and stuff like that. What are your thoughts on the rock and roll hall of fame and just being in it? And uh, I, Always thought it was kind of a cool thing. Uh, you know, we lived in Cleveland forever. I remember when they built it there and the big vote, what city should it go to? And then the fame, I, I love art and architecture. So the famous architect, I am pay built that and designed that whole thing. So, you know, I, well, the first time I was on tour since after it got built, you know, cause I was in LA or whatever, you know, we took a, we took the whole afternoon to go in there. So when it came up that it, that we'd gotten in in 2020 it was like what you know and and trent has this kind of ad he did have this attitude of oh that stuff doesn't mean anything grammys you know it's all just whatever you know he didn't he was genuinely so thankful and excited and grateful and it like meant a lot to him um and uh Unfortunately, of course, it all got canceled because of COVID. So we didn't get to do the red carpet. We didn't get to do the everybody walk up on stage and get our big trophies. Mm. They just mailed them to us. Um, and that was a real bummer. But Trent made up for it in 2022. Um, you can find us on YouTube all over. The, there's one official video for Wish. And then everybody's got there's tons of videos of the whole set. Us original founding members, we had secret rehearsals out in L.A., um, and we did a we had a 30 minute set of songs only from Pretty Hand Machine and Broken, mm -hmm. like early, early stuff. So Trent was doing two years worth of makeup dates um, because of canceling 2020 and then 2020 
one when you know it all hit he was very cautious about that he's got a big family and you know he was very careful with the with the covid thing so in 2022 the final stop of that tour was back home at the blossom music center which is a 30,000 seat outdoor amphitheater with the big lawn and all that so he and his organ his people organized a nine inch nails weekend at the rock and roll hall of fame and so he had special merch made up inside the rock and roll hall of fame there's a 150 seat theater so like the first in the fan club that got tickets were allowed to come in and fill the theater for that and they got a goodie bag and then all, nine of us all came out sat and we did this whole round table discussion for a couple hours that's on youtube you can watch the whole round table we we did tours we did a photo shoot in front of our plaque and everything with all of us and stuff and then the next night was the blossom night you know the show and i don't know how we kept it secret for nine months but no, it never leaked that we had had these secret rehearsals with with me and rich patrick and danny loner and charlie clouser and everybody and so they play their two hour set and then instead of ending the set and then coming back for an encore lights went down trent played something on piano i can't remember what it was it was something off of the fragile, I believe, like a little piano solo bit. Maybe it wasn't Lemur. I don't care what it was. But anyway, while that's all dark and one pin spot on him, all the smoke, my drum set gets wheeled out on my riser. Danny's amps come out. And then we started, you know, one of the songs. And then, you know, and then we played this 30 minute set. And man, I have never heard 30,000 people that loud in my life. Like, like I could hear through my in ear monitors, purple. Holy shit, that's Rana, you know. And then the light came up on Danny, and then it came up on Robin, and then Charlie, and you know, and then his current band he's had together for God, fifteen years now with Elon and 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 Atticus and everybody. So, um, yeah, man, that just blew people's minds. So that night, uh, and again, you can find us on YouTube. Um, the, the there's an official version because Trent had like nine camera people all scattered around for this one special kind of a farewell show thing. Um, and the, overnight they got in a hotel room and edited together a professional, like the official version of wish. So you can see that on YouTube, but you can go on there and just type in 2022 nine inch nails reunion show. And it's all in there. So we did get to actually do our thing, even though COVID ruined it in 2020. Yeah. That well, was a great weekend. Yeah, I remember talking to Richard Patrick about it. I've been to the Blossom Music Center once. I'll never go back. It was so hard to get in and out of it. Oh, getting in and out. My sister and her husband and my niece and nephew came. I did let, I was like, you guys are going to want to come see the show. So here's some tickets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't say why, but I was like, you're going to want to be here. So oh, she nightmare. texted me. It was like three and a half hours. She's like, you know, we're still not even... <laughs> like, you know, we're still here and yeah. they live in Georgia. So uh, that's the worst venue ever. But, well, listen, yeah. uh, my, my time is going to end here, but uh, I just want to say thank you. And uh, will you come back on? Because there's so much okay. stuff I haven't even talked to you about. I mean, Chinese Democracy, one of my favorite records. Metallica. Oh, I mean, man, dude, yeah. that's a story in another. I mean, there's a half hour right there. My my very brief moment in of one of 17 drummers in, in Guns N' Roses. Um, but uh, I will say Axel was cool back then. Right, I mean, well, fucking, you know, but I'm just so excited to come into Michigan. You know, I always say that my dad went there. So I grew up a Wolverine fan. I think in the press release, I gave him a picture of me at like yep. 10 or 12 at Niagara Falls with my, yep. with my 1970s trucker cap. That is real, man. I grew up with that. And my dad and I, every Saturday would watch the Woody Hayes, Bo Schembechler, you know, every season there was that thing. And, and like, so Move, coming to Michigan, I feel like I just got like drafted like in the first round or something. Like when they called and said I got the job, I, That's I couldn't. Awesome. Yeah, so. I, 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 you know what? You've almost talked me into signing up for your course. Like, <laughs> I'm a little too old for that, but uh, yeah. listen, hey, we, we got to get you're you. Never back. too old, but we'll talk about that again. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to come on anytime. I'm, I, I can't wait to move. I, I move up on the early June to, to Ann Arbor, so I can have the summer to settle into the house figure out where my office is the campus is so big they're like remember when you had a meeting and then we walked over to i'm like you're gonna need to give me a map in like a week to figure out the campus you know before i start teaching in august so well anyway. good luck with everything man i really appreciate your time and we'll, we'll we yeah we got to do a part two because you have so many stories we haven't even touched on. <laughs> yeah i know and i i can always time in my education now and everything else it's it's because it, that's kind of what i do um although 
now with getting some summers off, I, I have already talked to a couple of people. I'm like, hey man, if you end up touring in summer, you know, doing a short run, <laughs> not nine sales, but other people, I'm like, you know, I get mid May through mid August off. So that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been behind a kitten so since 2022. So anyway, I will let you go. And thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, we'll talk again.